All right, we're going to go through uh, Hebrews rather quickly. Obviously, on our website, we have lectures through Hebrews, and I don't know how many lectures there are, probably 12 or 15 or something. I don't know how many there are, but uh, we won't go that long tonight. Um, so the, the book of Hebrews is laid out fairly uh, logically. It follows a, it starts in a certain place and argues from that place logically from next step to next step, and that's one thing that always impressed me when I first read Hebrews, how that it satisfied my my tastes in a, a logical presentation with no gaps, uh, you know, from one thing uh, following naturally and logically the next. And that's how the author uh, argues. However, he interrupts himself many times, and there are quite a few uh, what we'd have to call parentheses, where he's uh, he, he breaks away briefly from his argument to give a, a warning, brief or long. The first one is in chapter 2 and is only four verses long. But the next one is a bit longer, uh, from Hebrews 3, 12 to 4, 1. And then the next one goes quite long from the uh, from chapter 5, um, verse 12, to chapter 6, verse 8. And we've got then Hebrews 10, we were talking about just before the break, 26 through 39, and then chapter 12, Verses 25 through 29. Now, these are the the briefest part. These are the... Uh, some of these, really, you could make the passage longer belonging to the warning. Because he blends the warning into the next point he's going to make. And so it's not always clear where he sees himself beginning the warning, although usually it's clear. Uh, but where he ends it is not always clear. Because sometimes the the, the warning section is kind of trailing off and... Well, the argument is reintroduced, so it's kind of, uh, it's not always easy to find the exact end to the parenthesis, if we could call it that. But, but we're going to look at those passages very carefully, and, uh, we'll, we'll just stream through the book here. Um, now, the first two chapters are there to show that Christ is superior to A, the prophets, and B, the angels. He's also going to say in chapter 3 that Christ is superior to Moses. And in the course of the next chapters, he's going to talk about how uh, he's greater than Joshua because Joshua led the people into the rest of uh, conquering Canaan, resting from their wanderings there. But Christ leads us into a greater rest, which is a spiritual rest. And what he's doing is picking out respected uh, representatives of the Old Covenant and saying, well, yeah, he, no, no doubt they are great, but... They're nothing compared to Jesus, and he's making that point. Because, as I said earlier, his reader, his target audience are Jews who, of course, were raised respecting Moses and the prophets, and very well should. But they were kind of tending to diminish the value of Jesus and and, and uh, kind of slip back into uh, admiring the Jewish things, all things Jewish. And that was, of course, to avoid persecution that they were receiving for, for their strong commitment to Christ. And they thought, well, do I really need that, uh, that persecution? Maybe I can just go back to these other great heroes in the law that God gave through them. This is God's religion, isn't it? And it was, but the writers could say, yeah, but it's obsolete now. Now, the first comparison and contrast is between Christ and the prophets. And he said in verse 1, God, who at various times and different ways spoke in time past to the fathers, meaning our ancestors, by the prophets. That's that's good. The Jews had the prophets. No one else had them. The Gentiles didn't ever have the prophets of them. These men who were inspired by God, speaking the oracles of God to the people of God, that was a unique privilege that Israel had under the Old Covenant. And... Uh, he says, God has spoken to our fathers various ways and at various times through the prophets, which is great. But he says, in these last times, which is in contrast to in time past, verse 1 talks about in time past, he spoke through prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, the word his is not in the Greek. In fact, there's no uh, no descriptor of son. 
In the Greek language, there's simply the noun hoios, son, but there's no article and there's no pronoun there like his. Uh, some would insert the word through the son, but that would suppose there's an article also. Generally speaking, in a Greek text, if a, a noun has no definite article, it can stand with no article or it presupposes an indefinite article. I say, what's an article? A definite article is the. The word the is a definite article. The word a is an indefinite article. If I speak of the boy, I'm talking about a definite person. If I say a boy, I'm not speaking of anyone in particular, just a boy, at least I haven't identified. The a is an indefinite article. The is a definite article. If the, if the Greek doesn't have the definite article, it can be presupposed to have the indefinite article or none at all. In this case, there's no definite article and the word his is not there. It can easily be read, he spoke in times past to our fathers through the prophets, but in his last days has spoken to us by a son. Now he's of course referring to God's son, he's referring to Christ, but saying a son would be in contrast to, yet it's not just another prophet. The one that he speaks to now is not just another prophet. There have been a lot of those. Our fathers were spoken to many times through the prophets, many ways through the prophets. But God didn't send a prophet again this time. He sent a son. Now, by saying a son, he's not suggesting that God has multiple sons. He's simply saying that the one that God sent has the status of a son rather than just a messenger. And this contrast is found in the parable that Jesus taught in Matthew 21 about the vineyard and the tenants. And Jesus summarizes Israel's history saying that God planted a vineyard or somebody planted a vineyard. He leased it out to tenants. And when it was time for the grapes to be produced, he sent servants to say, where's the harvest? Where's the grapes? And these servants were abused, rejected, and killed. And it says, last of all, he sent his son and said, certainly they'll respect him. A son has greater status than a mere servant. The prophets were referred to as servants of God. Uh, but the son is not a servant. Um, in, in Jesus in John chapter 8 said, He that commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not remain permanently in the house, but the son does. And if the son sets you free, you're free indeed. There's a difference between a servant and a son. The prophets were servants. They were great. No problem with the prophets. We love them. But the one he has sent now is not a servant, it's a son. Uh, one who has the status of, a, of the heir of, of God's things and therefore the ruler. The son of the ruler is the next ruler. And therefore he's not just like the household servants of the, in the king's house. And that's the contrast that we made. Now having mentioned Jesus, he says of him, uh, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. Now, we know from John 1, 1, that in the beginning was the word, and by him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So through him, the worlds were made. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 says the same thing, that all things were created through Jesus. The writer of Hebrews affirms that too. Jesus was the active agent in creation, unlike any created thing himself. Uh, then it says who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he, the son, had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. Now, he's better than the prophets. He's also better than the angels. Now, how much better than the prophets is he? Well, he's the very express image of God. He's the son of God. He's the heir of all things. He's the supreme authority. He is the image and glory of God himself. Okay, so none of the prophets were that. And even the angels aren't that. But the mention of the angels is not simply there to find somebody else to compare Christ favorably against. The angels were believed by the Jews to have had an active part in the giving of the law. Which, of course, gives the law a certain dignity if, if men received it from the hand of angels. 
Now, the Old Testament doesn't actually say that this is the case. The Old Testament doesn't tell us that angels in any way mediated uh, in the giving of the law. But there are three New Testament passages that seem to confirm the Jewish notion. One was in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. He was rebuking the Sanhedrin and said, You may always resist the Holy Spirit. You receive the law through the mediation of angels, and you have not kept it. So basically saying they're correct, or at least he's willing to not argue that point. He'll give them that, that the law was given through angels. But they didn't keep it. In Galatians also, uh, Paul talks about the mediation of angels in the giving of law, which I think was in uh, chapter 3 or 4 when he's talking about that there. Here, he also says it in chapter 2, when he says in verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast. Now, he's re- actually referring to the law because he says the word spoken through angels, every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. He's talking about the, the punishments in the law given to people who didn't obey the law. These are said to be the words given through angels. So the mention of the angels and Christ's superiority over them is simply his way of naming angels as one of those things that those who would support Torah observance would say, well, how can you not observe Torah? Angels. God used angels to give it to us. I mean, they're superhuman beings. They're not just prophets. And he says, well, okay, I'll give you that. It came through angels. Sure, that's fine. But even angels are grossly inferior to Christ. And that's the point that he makes by quoting a number of interesting verses from the Septuagint. He says in verse 4 that he has obtained, uh, well, uh, yeah, having become so much better than the angels, verse 4, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That is a more excellent status. Having died and risen again, We're going to find the writer saying in chapter 2 that Jesus was made for a little while lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now, Jesus was never lower than the angels in status. That is, he always was the creator of the angels and therefore their king. That's why the angels worshipped him at his birth. They weren't worshipping their inferior, they are worshipping their superior. But the thing is, when he became a man, he took on the condition lower than the condition of the angels. They don't die. He did. He became a mortal being. And God made man a little lower than the angels, the writer says, for the suffering of death. Jesus became lower than the angels for a little while to become mortal. But now, having gone through that, he's now been exalted far above all principalities and powers and every name that is named at the right hand of God. And so he has obtained, uh, you know, a a more excellent name or status or rank uh, than they have ever had. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is a quote from Psalm 2-7, which is quoted also by Peter on the day of Pentecost as something that uh, that God said to Jesus. Um, and and so Jesus is called a son. When did he ever call, when did he ever speak that way to an angel? Never. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. This is an interesting quote because it's a quote from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14, which is technically about the seed of David that would come. And it was spoken by Nathan the prophet to David when David wanted to build a temple. And God sent Nathan to say, no, you're not going to build a temple, but your son will build a temple. Uh, a son who will come out of your own bowels will sit on your throne after you. And I, he will build a temple to my name. And, and I'll be a father to him and to him a son. It sounds like it's talking about Solomon. Because Solomon was the son of David who ruled after him, who built the temple. But but Jews have always understood that that prophecy, though it is about Solomon, it is Solomon as a type of the Messiah. Because he goes on to say that he will establish his kingdom forever. And that statement was the first time uh, that the Jews found warrant to say the Messiah will come from David. It was the first messianic prophecy that mentions David as the ancestor of the Messiah. So in that prophecy, it says, I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. Second Samuel seven fourteen. Technically, one could read that passage. That's talking about Solomon. But the writer of Hebrews says, no, it's talking about Jesus, which agrees with the Jewish idea, an assumption they made about it. And I think apparently correctly that this looks beyond Solomon. 
to one who, of whom Solomon is only a type and a shadow, and that is the son of David who would be the Messiah. For six, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. This is a Septuagint rendering of Deuteronomy 32, verses, verse 43. Now, it doesn't read like that at all in your Old Testament because your Old Testament is translated from, from the Hebrew, from the Masoretic text into English. And the Septuagint, in translating the Hebrew text into Greek, sometimes rendered it differently than we have it in our Hebrew text. Now, it's not clear whether the Septuagint translation is therefore a flawed translation or whether our Hebrew text has come down to as flawed since the Septuagint was translated from an earlier Hebrew text than one we have. In other words, the Hebrew text we have, the earliest we now have, is not the Masoretic, but the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the Septuagint was translated from Hebrew manuscripts 300 years older than those and translated into Greek. If they were an excellent translation, and the New Testament writers always quote from the Septuagint, so they must have trusted it, then it must or may represent a purer form of the Hebrew text than the ones that have come down to us through the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, again, the Septuagint is almost 300 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls and used manuscripts in Hebrew that we don't have. So there's some would argue that Septuagint is to be preferred over the Hebrew text that we have. Others, not. And we can't solve that problem here. It's going to be a scholarly debate forever, probably. But uh, the truth is that the writer of Hebrews only quoted from the Septuagint. And in some cases, the Septuagint rendering of a passage made a point that you don't find in our versions of the Hebrew. Whether our version is defective or whether the Septuagint is defective, we don't know. The writer of Hebrews just went with it because uh, that's the translation they had. And it said there, let all the angels of God worship him. Now, all the angels of God did worship Jesus at his birth. And so uh, he says in verse 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says. So when Jesus was born in the world, that's when the angels were commanded to worship him. And they did, and the shepherds heard them. Verse 7, and the, to the angels he, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, this is from Psalm 104, verse 4, and it, too, is uh, a little different in the Hebrew than in the Septuagint, but uh, it's close. The idea being <clears throat> his angels are creations. He made them. They're created spirits. He's not. He, in contrast to that, verse 8, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. That's Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. The notable thing here is that God speaks to the Messiah and says, Your throne, O God, calling him God. Uh, now, people who don't believe in the deity of Christ, they'll try to argue that away. They'll say it should be rendered something somewhat different. But the whole point in quoting it in this place is to, in, is to point out that he is deity. And that's why he's above the angels. Uh, there's really not much of anything else in these verses that would point out that he's better than the angels, except that God referred to as God, which would obviously automatically make him greater than the angels. Verse 10, and this is a quote from Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. It says, and you, Yahweh, now notice he's saying this is spoken to Jesus because this is a continuation of verse 8. To the Son, he says, a couple of things. To the Son, he says, the things in Psalm 45 that are recorded in verse 8 and 9. But to the Son also, he says, what's in Psalm 102, 25 through 27, and he calls him Yahweh. God speaks to the Son and calls him Yahweh. It just says he called him God in verse 8. He calls him Yahweh. The word Lord in all capital letters there in verse 10 is in the Hebrew original uh, Yahweh. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. Now, all the heavens, the stars and so forth were made by him. 
Uh, he's older than they are. He's called Yahweh by God, or at least by the psalmist, and that's trustworthy. So basically saying he doesn't grow old like deity doesn't grow old. God doesn't grow old either. Verse 13, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? This is the most often quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament, Psalm 110, verse 1. It refers to Jesus ascending to heaven and sitting down at the right hand of God, which we read about happening in Acts chapter 1. And many references to Christ sitting at the right hand of God or being at the right hand of God are found throughout the New Testament. Every time though that expression is used, it's alluding to or quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, which, as I say, is the one verse in the Bible quoted more often in the New Testament than any other Old Testament passages. Uh, it's about the kingship of Jesus at the right hand of God. Then he says about angels in verse 14, Are they not all ministering spirits? The word ministering means serving, servants. They're servants only, just like the prophets are just servants of God, so the angels are just servants of God. Are they not all serving spirits sent forth to serve for those who will inherit salvation? So they're, in a sense, even below us. We're the ones who inherit salvation, and God sends his angels as to serve our needs. It says in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord encamps around about those who fear him and delivers them. In Psalm 37, I think it's verse 8 or 7 or 8. In Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, it says he has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they'll bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That's The angels are sent to take care of uh, those who are heirs of salvation. He continues. And this, the first four verses here are his first stern warning about not falling away. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, meaning the gospel, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward that is under the law, there was a, a, a fixed reward or punishment for disobedience. If that was true, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So the basic sentence here is, if there is a strong punishment, a severe punishment for those who disobeyed the law, which had you know, maybe the authority of angels behind it because it was delivered by angels, but, but what about the law? What about that which came from the Son of God? What about that which Jesus spoke? Which, uh, it's not as if we have any doubts about it, because it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And and the message was confirmed by signs and wonders and miracles and works of the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, we, we have no doubt that, that Jesus, this message about Jesus is true. We have the eyewitness testimony, the miracles that God gave to attest to it. And therefore, how, we have no excuse, in other words. If we, if we neglect what Jesus said, how can we escape if we neglect this salvation? Now, I want to say, this often was used in evangelistic verse. How shall you escape if you neglect so great salvation? I think preachers who use it think that it says, if we reject so great salvation. You know, you've got the offer of salvation, you reject it. You don't become a Christian. He's not writing to non-Christians. He's writing to Christians. You can't really neglect something that you don't already have. You can reject something that you don't have and never have it. Or you can have it and neglect it. And this is not writing to non-Christians about their need to make sure they get saved. This is saying your salvation is a life that has obviously duties. It has uh, responsibilities. You, you have signed on to be a follower and a servant of Christ. You have signed on to be soldiers in his army. You have responsibilities. You must not neglect that. Salvation is not just going to heaven. Salvation is being reconciled to God on his terms, which, of course, his terms are submit to me. And if you neglect all the things uh, associated with this, in other words, if you leave Christ and just give up on, on these responsibilities and neglect them, you think you're going to get away with that? They didn't even get away with breaking the law of Moses, which maybe had angels behind it, but We've got, this is from the Son of God himself. You're going to get away with neglecting what he says? That's the warning right there. Then he goes back. 
It says, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. Back on the subject of angels. The angels might have delivered the law to the people, but they are not the ones who are going to rule the world. They don't have that status. Who does? Well, one testified in a certain place. This is according to Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, this in a sense is a statement about Jesus, but it's primarily a statement about man in general. He's going to point out that Jesus became a man. So this applies to him especially, but... But David was talking about man. David was talking about himself and men in general. Where I consider the heavens, the works of your hands, the, you know, the moon and the stars that you've made. What is man that you are mindful of him? That's, that's the portion of the psalm that's not quoted here. The point is, man is so small. And yet, God has crowned him with glory and honor, made him ruler over all, all God's creation. Well, that's true. That's Genesis 1. 26, God said, let us make man in our own image. Let's give him dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. This is simply affirming that. David says, how could you do that, God? You're so big and your, your creation's so awesome and we're so small and, and uh, tiny and unimpressive and yet you put us in charge over everything. That's true. And that's why Jesus became a man. For him to rule over all things, he can't bypass the rule that God has already given to mankind. He has to become part of the human race. And he did. He's also God. But as God, he participated in human nature as well. And he's going to make that point here before this chapter is over. Uh, but the point he's making is, it wasn't angels that were promised that they're going to rule the world. It's man. Now, Jesus, therefore, became a man. And in doing so, he became part of a race that's more privileged than if he had become an angel. Because this promise isn't made to angels, it's made to men. And so he says in the middle of verse 8, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That is, God gave all things that God created to man to rule over. Now, of course, he says, but we don't yet see all things put under him. Man doesn't control everything. A lot of the animals, because of the fall, are wild and untamed, and, and man doesn't really, the, the rule of man is not absolute and, and universal yet. But we do see Jesus, a man, Okay, we don't see uh, the whole creation really under mankind as God made it to be because of the fall. But we have one person who's overcome all of that. One man. We see Jesus, the man, who was made a little lower than the angels, as all men are. That's what the psalm said. God made man a little lower than the angels. Well, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. He became a man to be part of the race to whom the rule of the world is has been given. He's going to rule the world. We're going to rule with him. He's the one who's going to lead us to rulership because uh, he can overcome what we couldn't overcome ourselves. But he had to become part of this whole species in order to do it. So we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned now with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So not just for the elect, he tasted death for everyone. Uh, and of course, that's affirmed many times in scripture. But the point here is that he tasted death for everyone as our substitute, I believe. And um, so he's saying we all benefit. It's as if the death that we all had to suffer, he suffered for us all. And so we now are beneficiaries of what he went through. For it was fitting... For him, from whom are all things, meaning the Father, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, that is, of one nature. The one who sanctifies us is Jesus. We are the ones being sanctified, but we have he has taken on the same nature we have. He can do that for our for the human race because he's now tapped into it as, as a member. And just as Adam's participation in the human race, uh, you know, infected the human race, so Christ tapping into the human race also infects the human race with his own righteousness and with his own uh, salvation. So it was fitting for him 
in bringing many sons to glory, not just Jesus. He's just the first fruits. And it says this also, by the way, in in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, whom he foreknew, he also did predestine to become conformed to the image of his uh, son, that he might become the first of many brethren. That, that God had in mind, not that Jesus be the only glorified son, but he, that he'd have many brethren like himself. And that's what it says here. In bringing many sons to glory, he made Christ perfect through suffering. Now, wasn't Christ perfect already? Well, obviously he was morally perfect. Perfect doesn't only mean that. Uh, you know, something that's perfect is something that has no room for improvement. And when he came to earth, he was a baby. He wasn't mature. He had to learn to talk. He had to learn scriptures like any other person. He had to learn to walk. He was not a perfect human in the sense of having no growth to to go through, nothing to learn. He had to learn everything just like any baby does. He was morally perfect because he was God in human form, but he, in taking human form, he took on the weaknesses of a human being so that unlike God, Jesus could become weary. Unlike God, Jesus could be tempted. Unlike God, Jesus could die. He took on human weaknesses and did so as a baby so that he had to grow through the human experience. He had to skin his knees. He had to suffer and eventually, of course, suffer even death and and torture. But that's how he was perfected. That's how he came to, to be totally lacking in nothing for his purpose of being a redeemer. He couldn't be a redeemer until he had died. He was made perfect for that task complete for that task by dying the things he suffered was part of the process of making him all that god intended him to become for both he who sanctifies those who are being sanctified are of one that is they're all human of one nature for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren he calls us his brethren and he quotes the scripture to make that point which is psalm 22 22 a very famous messianic psalm and that psalm says I, apparently the Messiah speaking, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. And again, in Isaiah 8, 17, he said, I will put my trust in him. So Jesus had to come down like us and trust in God just like we do. He was God, but he took on the same nature as we have so that he had to trust in God just like we do. He could call us his brothers, because he actually became part of one of our human brothers on earth. That's the point he's making. And then, of course, uh, he quotes Isaiah 8.18. Here I am and the children whom God has given me. So I don't know why he mentions this first, because this refers to us as his children, not as his brothers. But the point is, he's basically saying he's part of our family. He's part of the human family. Inasmuch, then, as the children... That is, the children mentioned in the previous verse, who are the Christians, God's people, the people he wanted to redeem. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, which simply means they're human beings, he himself likewise shared in the same. He became a human being. Since the people he needed to save were human beings, he had to take on the same nature and be a human being too. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Through death, Jesus destroyed Satan. The word destroy there is katergeo in the Greek. It means to reduce him to inactivity. Somehow, he his death brought an end to certain activities of Satan, or at least greatly curtailed them. And uh, and and this is affirmed elsewhere in Scripture, a place that we don't have time to look right now. And he did this to release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, through fear of death, the devil had kept everyone in in bondage. You'll, like, like the devil said to God about Job, skin for skin, all that a man has, he'll give in exchange for his life. You can get a guy to do anything if his life is on the line. You put a gun to his head and you tell him to do something, he'll do it. That's what the devil thinks. But that's only those who are in bondage to the fear of death. You see... All our lifetimes, we were in bondage to the fear of death. But what Christ had delivered those who were all their lifetime in bondage, were not in bondage to the fear of death. Go fire away. If someone says, deny Christ or I'll shoot you, I say, have fun. 
Hope you enjoy it. You only get one shot. Because the fear of death, we're free from that. And Christ, through his death, delivered us from that fear of death. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Aaron. Now, I don't think that means he wouldn't help angels when they need help. But it, it's saying that the aid that he offers, uh, that he's vouchsafed to those who need his help, are people. The children of Abraham, not the angels. Again, the people have a status, in a sense, a favor before God that's even in some ways superior to that of the angels. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he had to take on our nature, be mortal, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now, I won't go into this deeply, but the point is that Jesus did suffer temptation. In James, it says God cannot be tempted with evil. But Jesus as a man could be. And he, and he's been tempted. It's going to say later on in chapter four in verse 16, uh, or actually verse, uh, 15, it says he was all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. He had to become a human to be subject to temptation because God isn't subject to temptation. So he did become like us. He was tempted in all points like we are, but he didn't sin. And yet he knows how hard it is not to sin. Nobody knows how hard it is not to sin as much as somebody who successfully resists temptation. The person who gives in to temptation never finds out how hard it would be to continue resisting it. They know something of it. For, if they resist for a few minutes or a few hours, they, they know how hard that is. But Jesus, when you give in, you never really know the full weight of what it means to fully resist sin because you didn't do it. He did fully resist sin. He, he knows how hard it is. I heard a preacher many years ago say, I think maybe the first thing Jesus said when he got back to heaven was, boy, those guys have it rough down there. <laughs> He's a compassionate high priest. He's been through it, so he knows. And therefore, uh, you don't have to worry that he's going to say, well, you did that again. Come on. What's wrong with you? Uh, you know, he knows how hard it is because he's been through it too. Now, taking a, a bit of a turn, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Now, that's a statement God made about Moses in Numbers 12, 7, when uh, Aaron and, and Miriam were kind of challenging Moses' authority because they also prophesied. Now, why, should, why should Moses get all the, all the uh, you know, an admiration? We, we, God speaks through us, too. And God put leprosy on Miriam and, and, and terrified Aaron and said, listen, if I call a prophet, I'll, I'll speak to him in a dream or a vision. But my servant Moses is not like them, who is faithful in all my house. With him, I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently. And the likeness of the Lord, he will see. Now, he's better than a prophet. Moses is greater than the prophets. We've already been told that Jesus is greater than prophets. But is he greater than Moses? Moses and Jesus were both greater than the prophets. But Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses was faithful in all God's house, as God said. But then it says in verse 3, For as this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he did not, uh, as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And of course, Jesus is the one who, through whom all things were built. He's already said that. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. Moses was a faithful servant in all my house, he, God said. But Jesus, as a son, different than a servant in the house, a son. Verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. We Christians are his house. Peter tells us we're like living stones built up into a spiritual house, a temple of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets in whom the whole building grows into a holy habitation of God uh, through the Spirit. That's uh, the end of the last verses of, he of Ephesians 2. Many places in Scripture tell us the church, the people of God, are the house of God. This is one of those. He says, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope 
firm to the end. And that is if we don't give up the faith. If we don't backslide, if we don't defect, if we don't apostatize, we're his house. Well, what if we do apostatize? Well, all bets are off then. This is only a statement that applies to those who don't defect. Okay? And that's what he's urging them to not do. Now he quotes at length from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Instead of reading the whole thing, because I have to start moving faster, he reminds them that the psalmist said in Psalm 95 that to his own generation, they should not tempt God as the Israelites tempted God when they refused to go into the promised land. And, uh, and that God swore that those who'd said that would not enter into his rest. Now, we know that what he's talking about is those spies who went in and came back and brought the bad report convinced most of the, well, all of Israel, to not go into the promised land. And said, God said, okay, you're not going to enter the rest there. You're going to wander. You're not going to have any rest. You're going to move around the wilderness the next 40 years until you're all dead and your children will go in. But the rest he's referring to is the settled uh, security in, in the promised land. And resting there from their labors and their wars and things like that, having rest. Now, Deuteronomy, Moses actually refers to Canaan as the rest. He says, you have not yet entered the rest that the Lord has taken in you, Moses said uh, to them. And so, that's Deuteronomy, uh, well, there's a lot of times in Deuteronomy that's found there. 25, 19, I think. I think 12, 9, maybe. Anyway, um, but he's... Uh, but. The quotation from Psalm 95 ends with God saying he swore to those people they would not enter his rest. Now, what the writer of Hebrews is going to do here, he's going to say, well, why? But the, but the Jews, a later generation, did enter into Canaan. So they must have entered into God's rest. But then why is David, hundreds of years later, exhorting a later generation of Jews that they need to make sure they don't make the mistake, same mistake and fail to enter into the rest? Now, he's saying the mistake was made by the generation that came out of Egypt. They were, because of their lack of faith, they were not permitted to enter into Canaan, into the rest. But it was 600 years later that David said, don't fail where they did, because God told them they won't enter his rest. Now, the writer of Hebrews is saying, David is implying that he wants his generation to look forward to entering the rest and not to make the same mistake that prevented others from entering it. But then the writer's going to say, well, there must then be a rest that Joshua didn't bring them into. Joshua did bring them into the promised land, the next generation. They did come in at rest. But there must be another rest. Or else the prophet, David wouldn't have spoken to a later generation about the need to enter into God's rest. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is going to do with this. He's going to say, we need to enter into God's rest. But he's not talking about entering into physical Canaan. He likens the rest that we enter into to entering Canaan which was the rest that they came into, and also the Sabbath rest. He's going to use both of those as illustrations. And he's going to then say in chapter 4, there's also a rest we have to enter. However, in chapter 3, verse 12 through uh, 4, 1, we have the second severe warning about backsliding. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Apparently that's a real danger. Well, well, only only fake Christians could ever do that. No. Who's he writing to? What's it say in verse 1? Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. This is addressed to holy brethren, not fake Christians. Partakers of the heavenly calling. These are the real Christians he's writing to. He says, don't depart from the living God. By the way, you can't depart from God if you've never been with him. You can only depart from a place that you've already been you can't leave a place you've never been. So beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence or our faith steadfast in. A second time, he says, if we stay in the faith, we are partakers of Christ. If we stay in the faith, we are the house in verse 6. There's two warnings about that. Now, by the way, Paul uses uh, essentially the same warning in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, notably, which has the same conditionality of, of being saved in it. Uh, Colossians, I want to give you this. I don't want to turn to too many passages because we have so little time. But uh, Colossians 
Paul says, well, I'm going to give you 22. Um, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh, us, through death, to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight, if indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So if you don't move away from your beliefs in Christ, if you don't depart from Christ, then you, you have been uh, uh, reconciled to become uh, holy and blameless in his sight. So the writer of Hebrews uses the same expressions here. But then he says in verse 15, uh, Hebrews 3.15, While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That's the quotation of one of the verses in Psalm 95, which he quoted earlier. He keeps coming back to quoting pieces of that all the way through uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 10. Now, he says, the, the psalmist said, today, if you'll hear his voice. Who's the psalmist talking to? The psalmist is talking about his own generation. He says, don't harden your heart like they did back then in that first generation that came out of Egypt. And God said they couldn't enter the rest. Don't make that mistake. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And he says, it goes on uh, in verse 19. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. That's the warning. Chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 1. Make sure you don't come short of entering the rest. He says there remains a, what? There remains a promise of entering the rest. Where do we get that? He deduces that from Psalm 95. The Jews were promised a rest, which was later entered by a generation of Jews under Joshua. But a later generation, David, urged us not to miss out on entering his rest. So there must be a promise of entering his rest still. And this would be, of course, a different kind of rest. We'll talk a moment in a moment what kind of rest that is. He says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They were given the promise, the good news of going into the promised land. They didn't inherit it because they didn't believe it. They didn't mix it with faith. Make sure we don't make that same mistake, he says. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Again, quoting from the psalm. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place, and that certain place is Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. He has spoken in a certain place, of the seventh day in this wise. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this psalm he says, they shall not enter my rest. Now there's two kinds of rest here. There's the rest that they didn't enter into by going into uh, Canaan. And there's also the rest that God entered when he rested on the seventh day. Now what, what the writer's going to say is, there is a rest that God enters when he has finished his work. We need to get into that rest. We need to rest in with his rest. In his finished work. There was a physical rest on the Sabbath day. There's a spiritual rest for us, which is our spiritual Sabbath. And he goes on to say in verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, he again designates a certain day in David's time, saying, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So he's saying, okay, there's a, a, an ongoing promise of this. For if Joshua had given them rest, which he did, but not the kind of rest that we're still expecting, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not after have spoken of another day. That is, David wouldn't have later said, hey, make sure you don't neglect to enter his rest. Well, why would that be necessary if Joshua had brought them into the final rest? There's another rest that needs to be brought into, of which the entrance into Canaan is only a type and a shadow. He says, verse 9, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. And as the Seventh-day Adventists love to point out to us, the word rest here in verse 9 is different than throughout the rest of the chapter because it is the word keeping of a Sabbath. There remains, therefore, a keeping of Sabbath for the people of God. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists say, see, that proves we're supposed to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. No, 
there is a keeping of Sabbath, not the original Sabbath, any more than there's a rest going into Canaan for us. We don't go into Canaan and we don't rest on the seventh day. There is a rest that both of those rests were a type and a shadow of. And that is the spiritual Sabbath. That's the spiritual rest. When he says there remains a Sabbath for us to keep, it's very much like what he said in 1 Corinthians 5 when he said, let us keep the feast, meaning the feast of unleavened bread. Not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth for Christ our Passover has been slain for us. Now, let us keep the feast because Christ, the Passover is followed by seven days of unleavened bread. Paul says, Christ is our Passover, so we keep a feast. We'll keep the feast of unleavened bread, but not the literal one. The one that it was a type of. Leaven was malice and wickedness. We're going to live a life of sincerity and truth, not malice. That's keeping the feast of unleavened bread. It's a spiritual thing. All the feasts and holy days in the Old Testament were types and shadows of something spiritual, including Sabbath. What is the Sabbath a type of? The same thing that entering Canaan is a type of. It's the rest that God promises his people. It's the rest that God enters and we enter it with him. For he who, verse 10, who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. We need to enter that rest. Now, what is the rest he's talking about? Most commentators on Hebrews see it differently than I do. They think it's talking about heaven. They think entering the promised land is a type of dying and going to heaven. And so we need to strive to make sure we go to heaven. Okay, well, that, um, that might be true, but, but he's not talking about going to heaven. He actually has said in verse 3, we who have believed do enter that rest. The rest comes with believing. It's not something we will enter. We do enter it when we believe. Likewise, when he says in verse 10, for he who has entered his rest, that's past tense. Some of us have entered in his rest. Some have not. Some need to. And he says, let us be diligent to enter that rest. This is something that we have to do. We're responsible to do. It's a promise. It's a privilege. But we have to do something to enter it. And it is apparently what he said. He that enters that rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. It's no longer a works-based righteousness we seek. It's in the finished work. Just like God finished the creation and rested on the seventh day, we see his work of redemption is finished and he has rested. Jesus sat down. It says in Hebrews 10, when it's talking about the same subject, in the Old Testament, the high priests are always seen standing up, always offering another sacrifice that never fully takes away sins because they have to repeat it every year. But he says, Jesus, by contrast, offered one sacrifice of himself once and for all and sat down. Sat down, he's in a posture of rest. The high priests in the Old Testament are never really seen resting because they always have another sacrifice. There's no completeness to what they've done. Christ offered himself and sat down because there's nothing more to do. Just like God rested on the seventh day because there's nothing more to do in the creation. It was done. It is finished, Jesus said when he died. And if it is finished, there's no more work to be done on that particular project, which is, of course, re redemption and atonement of man. Jesus did it with his own blood and sat down. We don't have to do it by working. He's finished working on that. He, he did that. That one's been done. He's resting now. Just like God rested on the Sabbath when he finished his, his creation work, Jesus is resting at the right hand of God, having finished the work of redemption. We enter into that rest when we stop seeking to be earning it with our own works and when we rest in what Christians have often called the finished work of Christ, a term that's not found in Scripture, but certainly is described. Christ is resting. We sit with him in heavenly places. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, we are in Christ, seated in heavenly places. We are resting in his finished work too. It's a state of mind and spirit that is the rest we're talking about here. Entering Canaan, the Sabbath rest, these were types and shadows of a spiritual condition that Christians come into by embracing what Christ has done and not seeking to earn it with our own works. And that's, of course, a rebuke to those who are going back to Judaism, which is all about works. Trying to do it right. 
trying to get right with God by enough good works. Sorry, that doesn't work. When you become a Christian, you're supposed to rest from that. You're not supposed to go back to that. That's his point. So, chapter 4, verse uh, 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I'm not sure why he words it all just like that. He's, er he's basically warning them very severely not to neglect the invitation and the, and the ultimatum that God has given to enter into his rest. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility we need to not neglect because God was very angry at the Jews when they neglected it in the days of Moses. We don't want to incur that kind of dis disfavor from God. But, but why say these specific things? I mean, these make great, great quotable proof texts. But how do they supply something to the argument? When well, he says, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I think probably he's saying we can't take the word of God lightly. We have this exhortation in Psalm 95, in the Word of God, to not harden our hearts, not fail where the Jews previously failed, not neglect the salvation, not to neglect, to fully enter into rest and live there and stay there. In other words, to give up all legalism, to give up all trust in Torah or laws and just trust in what Christ has done. That's the command, he says. That's how he interprets that command to enter into God's rest. And he says, and God's word, by the way, like this command, is no light thing. It's alive. It's powerful. Because it's alive, it still is applicable. It's not It's not a dead word about something that was applicable once and is no longer. It's a living reality or living truth, a living obligation expressed in it. It's powerful. It's sharper than to a sword. Now, that's true, of course. We have other things in the Bible like in the word of God to a sword, like Ephesians 6, 17, or Revelation chapter 9 of Jesus' mouth. But, but why does he say that here? I think the sword is considered to be uh, an... In Remember when Paul said in Romans 13, we need to make sure we don't disobey the government authorities because they bear the sword not in vain. They have a reason for carrying that sword, and that's to punish people. And God's word is, is sharper than a sword. It divides between soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Now, I'm not sure why he make, chose those four words. Some people say that proves that the soul and spirit are different entities because this word can divide between the soul and the spirit. Others say, well, no, the soul and the spirit are on one side of the divide. The joints and the marrow are on the other side. That he divides between the spiritual and the fleshly. The joints and the marrow are our bodies, our flesh. The soul and the spirit are our spiritual life. That God distinguishes between fleshly and spiritual. Now, the Jews kept the law according to the flesh, merely. But the word of God is going to distinguish between that and that which is in the heart, in the soul, in the spirit. And it, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That is, the word of God shows what's in the heart. God gives a command. Your obedience or disobedience to it show whether your heart is submitted to him or not. What, what's really your intentions? What are your thoughts and intents of your heart? Is it to obey God or not? Well, you find out as soon as God gives you a command and you take it seriously or you don't. The word of God divides between the Jews who are just trying to do things according to the flesh and the Jewish believers who have the spirit of God and are, are you know, seeking to pursue Christ in, in their spirit and in their heart. And he says, there's no creature hid from his sight, which sounds intimidating. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I remember Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, speaking against Christianity and against God. He complained that God's like always spying on us. God's always eavesdropping. You know, he doesn't much like having God being the peeping Tom. And, and uh, the reason he didn't is because he wanted to do immoral things. There's no question. Christopher Hitchens was uh, sexually immoral. His his brother, who was very close to him, said that he believed that Christopher Hitchens chose atheism because he wanted to fornicate. Uh, well, and, and Hitchens says, I don't want to believe in a God who's going to be watching me all the time. 
Yeah, I guess not. It's a little intimidating if you don't want to obey. And it does say there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I remember hearing back when I was raising my kids, some stupid person, some stupid Christian gave advice. You parents should never tell God, never tell your children that God's watching them. That'll make them afraid of God. That'll intimidate them. Don't ever tell them God's watching them. Well, Solomon told his son that God's watching him and said, don't, don't let him see you with a strange, embracing the breasts of a strange woman, for God is watching all the time. That's what Solomon said. Uh, actually, the writer of Hebrews says, you guys need to be reminded, God is watching. If God's watching, you need to live your life uh, taking that seriously and not taking him lightly. Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Again, don't don't slip away from your confession of faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He made the same point in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, as we saw. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, the high priest in, in the temple could go into the Holy of Holies, stand before the mercy seat, and offer petitions to God for the people. That's what he did on Yom Kippur every year. He didn't usually go in boldly, though. The high priest was never quite sure if he's quite worthy to go in. There are all kinds of washings and sacrifices that he'd be offering. But according to Josephus, they actually kept a rope around his ankle. In case he went into the Holy of Holies and God said, no, nope, you're not okay. And the guy died and they had to pull the rope out because they couldn't go in after him. Now, I mean, th- there was actual fear of going into the Holy of Holies on the part of any serious-minded Jew. But God sa- uh, the writer here says, we can go boldly into the presence of God, the throne of grace, which I take to be not very different than the mercy seat. A throne of grace, a mercy seat. Not sure what the difference would be between those two things. We can go before the mercy seat. We can go into the Holy of Holies. We come boldly into the presence of God, not because we've done enough good works. It's not going to be based on that. It's whether Jesus has done enough good works and whether we are in him. Now, in the same exhortation is given in Hebrews chapter 10, after he develops these thoughts even more, which we'll get into next time, I guess. But in chapter 10, verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness, to enter into the holiest, meaning the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us draw near to God. We can come with boldness into the holiest of all. Uh, because of the blood of Jesus and because we have a high priest that's interceding for us in Christ. So this is going to be a a prevailing message. We've got it in chapter 2 where he's our high priest. He's sympathetic. At the end of chapter 4, you know, he's been tempted like we are, so he's sympathetic. Uh, We can come boldly before God. Chapter 10, therefore, because of this, we should come boldly before God. The whole idea is God doesn't want us uncertain about our acceptance He wants us to be able to come boldly without fear and intimidation into the presence of God. That's what Christ has made, a new and living way through the veil, which is his flesh. And so the writer is saying, if you're thinking about going back to Judaism, you don't have any kind of assurance you can approach God. Even the high priest isn't 100% sure he's okay coming before God, much less the ordinary schmuck, Jew who doesn't really know and doesn't have any right to go in there. So... What are we to think? Well, you don't want to go back to Judaism. It doesn't offer this kind of assurance. It doesn't offer the rest that comes with faith in a finished work. And and he's going to actually develop those things more. Actually, what he's going to do in chapter 5, and this is a good turning point for us to quit at tonight. In chapter 5, he's going to introduce or focus upon. He's already introduced. He's going to focus on Christ as the high priest. He's mentioned it in passing at the end of chapter 2. He's mentioned it again at the end of chapter 4. In chapter 5, he's going to dive right into it, directly into it, 
And he's going to say that Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's going to defend that and say why that's superior. And then he's going to talk about, as a high priest, how Jesus uh, has fulfilled the Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement things in the spiritual sense, not entering into the holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat there. So he's going to, every, uh, everything from chapter uh, 5 through 10 is going to be about the high priesthood of Christ. And this is, by the way, the unique contribution that Hebrews makes to the Bible. We see that some of the things the writer of Hebrews said, Paul says also, and other writers say, because they're general truths that Christians sometimes mention in their writings. But the one thing that is never stated elsewhere in the New Testament is that Jesus is the great high priest. It is the priesthood of Jesus that is here expounded. Now, it is mentioned or alluded to by Paul in Romans 8, where he says, you know, that Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. That intercession, no doubt, is referring to his priestly intercession. But uh, he doesn't even use the word high priest. No one refers to Christ as the high priest except Hebrews. And it's those chapters 5 through 10 that are going to expound on that, as it is not expounded on anywhere else in the whole Bible. And uh, so I assume that in a month from now, we'll have a session covering those chapters, and then probably a session same night covering the remainder of the book which is only three chapters more after that.